welcome to an awesome edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. We've got Ashwin Rao, a teacher from Stanford. We've got Tikan Jelvis from Target. The two of them run AI at Target, one of the most impressive companies absolutely on the planet. So to have them is such an honor. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. You're going to come on and talk about your new book. So I would really appreciate uh, you coming on today. Thank you, Alex, for having us here. Um, I can get started by talking about our book. Yeah, the, the unique pedagogical style. Pedagogical style. Could you jump into that? Yeah. Um, so this book takes uh, this approach of teaching that Tikhon and I strongly believe in, which is that every concept in math or CS or related areas like physics require a three stage of learning, three stages of learning. The first stage is spending time on the intuition um, because people often learn concepts through Im imagery and imagination. So avoid all the technical details, avoid mathematical notation initially, oh. just focus on intuition. Ashwin, Ashwin, I couldn't be more in agreement with you. As someone who grew up with extreme learning disabilities, I had nearly 10 operations to be able to hear. I, I really, you know, couldn't use, uh, you know, audible sensory. And so I, I learned everything from, you know, visualization. So I, I completely agree with you. And then, you know, when I started learning my Hebrew, I still hadn't even learned my, my English yet. And I was learning Hebrew totally through visualization. So I yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. So, so every section of the book has these three phases. The first phase is uh, intuition, imagination, looking at a lot of physical examples, getting a feel for the subject, setting up the problem, motivating it, all that stuff. Once you've got through the intuition, the second part is the rigor. You set up the right notation, you write the formal proofs. That part can be a little bit boring, but once you've done the first part, people are a lot more prepared to deal with uh, some of the nuts and bolts of part two of the learning. And I think the part three is where the exciting part is, and which is why you know I have Tikhon as my co-author in the book. Part three is about programming the concept you just learned. So once you understand intuition, understand the math, the formal math, then you code it. And coding helps you get into all kinds of details with the models and algorithms, but it's also a powerful learning force because once you code it, it just sticks in your head forever. And coding will also help you draw some graphs. So if you've got a theorem proved, you can do like a simple simulation and just verify that this theorem holds. And that may be a simple thing uh, and maybe just 10 lines of code, but it has a very powerful influence of internalizing it and putting it into your long-term memory. And Tikhon, anything to comment on the learning yeah. by programming aspect? Absolutely. I mean, I've always thought that, you know, programming languages are a really powerful tool, not just for solving problems, but for actually building up a detailed understanding of specific abstractions or specific ideas. And one of the goals in the book is to use that to help the reader understand reinforcement learning, uh, not just at, a, at the level of applying it, but at a level of understanding the algorithms themselves and the connections between the algorithms and the core abstractions uh, that we're introducing. Yes, no, I, you know, reinforcement learning is something that I've been passionate about. I think it's really one of the more brilliant methods. Uh, to quote my good friend Gordon Ritter, I often do. It's, uh, you know, the idea of choosing when to trade a pawn for a rook. So, you know, it, it's definitely about, you know, taking a little more of an extreme path. I prefer reinforcement learning to deep learning in finance because I think deep learning is more of kind of a, a method for testing an algorithm and deep learning, it doesn't pivot as well. Reinforcement learning pivots better. And so, you know, when you know, in today's world, we have an ever-changing economy that's changing, the slope of change is increasing. So, you know, that's, that's tough for our, our, our L, I mean, for deep. Uh, learning. But for RL, it's a little better. And now we're looking at deep reinforcement learning. And Professor Jan McQueen, who was on the show last week, you know, thinks it's the most exciting uh, pathway. And in fact, one of my favorite students, an engineer student from Northwestern, who I've been working with now for a year, has been pushing me to really concentrate on deep reinforcement learning. 
So, uh, you know, Chikan, I'd love to hear your, your views on that. Yeah. Um, so, deep reinforcement learning, uh, it, you know, it, it is absolutely a really exciting area, and I think it's worth exploring. But it's also the kind of, you know, research field where to even get started in any kind of organized way, you have to first develop sort of separate understandings of both deep learning and reinforcement learning. Um, and so one uh, approach that I would take is to definitely learn how various reinforcement learning algorithms work without integrating deep learning. And only then, right, uh, add deep learning and understand what kind of capabilities deep learning adds to the base of traditional reinforcement learning. Um, and so in our book, the approach we're taking is very much focused on giving you this foundation from which you can make an informed foray into uh, the latest cutting edge research. Oh, fantastic. No, I, you know, I think right now, learning how to apply reinforcement learning to your niche of finance is one of the hottest trends and topics. It's, uh, you know, whether you're working at a, you know, global leader like Target, or you're at a global leader like Jane Street, reinforcement learning is going to prove useful for your area. And so this book you guys are releasing, you're on, it's, it's public and it's free. You guys are not charging any, you know, cost at all. Are you asking for donations? Nope. Uh, this is not a financial endeavor. Um, a book is not complete, to be clear. We've just done about 40% of the book. We'll upload chapters as they're written, get feedback. Um, we want to give it to the masses, really. I, I would be very happy if a kid in a village in India is reading this book. Uh, they don't have to come to Stanford to learn this topic. No, no, wonderful. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, you know, many of the Interns Rebellion will take will be very poor students from India. Uh, you know, we have at Rebellion, you know, we have about 120 students right now and such a high percentage of them are from India actually. That's um, for whatever reason, but you know, being able to access education and knowledge, you know, for free, I think is what the 21st century is about. And I think no greater topic, you know, is, is up there than in education. Because if we can have our next generation educated, and given an ability to thrive, then you know we will be in a much better position to eliminate poverty, eliminate uh, you know the wealth gap. Without a doubt, education is what is going to make this world function better. I, I don't think that there's any. I think it's a very simple answer. And so that's why you know when I first came across your book, I was very excited about it. And you know applications for reinforcement learning and finance all, is is essentially the hottest topic right now. I, I think in 2019. There were more reinforcement learning papers than uh, you know anything else. People are, are dying to learn about it. They're dying to use it. And they're dying to learn how to apply it, which is you know really what you know this book is about. So let's talk about st stochastic control. Uh, Ashwin, do you want to get into that? Look, uh, reinforcement learning is hard, but it's also very hard. And the big motivation for me when I created this course at Stanford. And this book is just an extension of my course really, is that I wanted to emphasize the foundations of reinforcement learning. So what's been in vogue these days, because it's so hot, a lot of people come in and latch on to the buzzwords of reinforcement learning. Like, you know, they hear about Q learning, they hear about policy gradient, and there is like code out there with these libraries that you can like hack together something and get it to work on a Jupyter notebook. But underneath there's a lot of very interesting and uh, somewhat advanced math at play and so we start the whole story with stochastic control uh, we, we build we emphasize the foundations of markov decision processes and the traditional way these solve problems were solved which is called dynamic programming and really the first 30 percent of the book is just that and uh, then we get into the finance in the middle part of the book. We show five financial examples like derivatives pricing, portfolio management, algorithmic trading, each of which can be cast as a stochastic control problem where you have states and actions and rewards. You set it up as a Markov decision process, 
traditionally you could have solved it with dynamic programming, but now with the complexity and scale, you can't really. And so you have to look at reinforcement learning as an option, which is really just a empirical way of solving these problems without having a model. So the, the last third of the book covers reinforcement learning algorithms, but by then you've got sufficient foundations in the, the mathematical foundations of stochastic control. And so reinforcement learning becomes much easier to understand once you've got the foundations. Reinforcement learning is really taken on uh, very quickly in video games. And you know, it still hasn't proliferated as quickly in finance. People are excited about it and they're looking to use it, but you know, it still isn't, you know, it's not making its way as quickly into you know, uh, hedge funds portfolios as uh, one would have expected. So, I mean, how long do you think it'll take for reinforcement learning to really get out there? Another few years, I think we're two, three years away from, you know. And then it, you know, we'll, we'll replace it, I mean, you know. Yeah, I think not, not in the next two years. I think we're probably five to 10 years away before I see a reinforcement learning algorithm working completely autonomously. Uh, in production, there's a there's a long tail of you know things that can go wrong, and financial industry tends to be very conservative because there are often big dollars at play. So it, it's a it's a hot area. I think it's a matter of time, probably five to ten years, but people have to get started. So a lot of financial companies who work with us at Stanford, I, I, I I'm fortunate to work with them. They're all investing in it. They've got teams building simulators, trying out different techniques creating the data engineering for reinforcement learning, that's a hard problem as well. So you, it will take years for them to get set up, experiment, organize, test, and then hopefully in five years, you will have you know, bots which will you know, trade algorithmically, not just for uh, these big corporations. I think reinforcement learning might be useful even for personal finance. What, what about a true market agent, uh, reinforcement learning that understood just the market as, uh, you know, you know, an entity itself. And so that's, that's an idea that Professor Halpern of NYU and I have been exploring with some of our students. Do you think that's something that could be successful in time? Do you think, you know, a, a pure market agent could be created or no? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the endeavor, right? We're, we're trying to build uh, agents that really learn continuously from the market through RL. Um, but again, it's not, the, I don't think it's going to happen in the next couple of years. I want, I want people to be a little bit patient about this. It's, it's a matter of time, but it's not the next two years. Yeah, I mean, I found reinforcement learning works best, you know, when you use it as specifically as possible and you try to create as much of a vacuum as possible. You really need to spoon feed the data and it's very important how you structure the data feed for the learner and the frequency and the timing of when the learner gets the data, at least I've found is extremely important as well. Is that something that you guys have found is very important? Yeah, like uh, games, I don't know, Tikhon, maybe you want to talk about this the fact that games are such a simple problem without all the data headaches compared to finance, where there are like- uh, You're a Berkeley man. And so Ashwin being a Stanford guy, do you guys ever have issues there? Do your cultures clash? <laughs> uh, think, no. Uh, uh, not particularly, yeah. Oh, wonderful. No, I, I love uh, Berkeley. I, I do a lot of work with uh, Berkeley Business School, actually. Yeah. I've uh, several students that I'm working with friends with a number of the faculty members. I, I think Berkeley is a wonderful institution. Yeah, but I think uh, the kind of pedagogy that we're taking with this book actually fits well with this idea that we're still pretty far away from having a fully autonomous, fully general purpose, you know, reinforcement learning based system. Because in practice, uh, I found that mixing some amount of domain knowledge and some amount of ideas specific to your application, whether it's in finance or in retail, um, tends to work a lot better than trying to tune a, a learning algorithm in a vacuum. And so having a toolkit where you understand approaches ranging from dynamic programming to different kinds of reinforcement learning um, opens you up to combining these ideas in ways that make sense for your specific, uh, specific problem. Um, and 
with the current state of the art, I would be willing to bet that that kind of approach would outperform um, more general purpose algorithms on you know, competitive finance problems. I don't know, I would definitely agree with that. Well, this has been an absolute great conversation. You know, it's such a quick show. I can't believe how fast the time flies. Before we finish, do you guys want to add some concluding uh, thoughts for our viewers? I mean, just, just so everyone knows, it's uh, you know, reinforcement learning foundations with applications in finance. You know, the book is you know, really fantastic, and I want everyone to, to check it out. But uh, anyway, before we sign off, I'd you know, love each of you to give some, some parting thoughts for our audience. It would be lovely. Yeah, I think Tikhon and I want to talk a little bit about the importance of software design. Mm -hmm. It's a big motivation for us in this book. Uh, I will tell you, Alex, that the applied math community and the software engineering commu community, they're very disjoint, which has been very troubling for me because I work in this intersection, so does Tikhon. One of our overarching goals beyond this book is to bring these two worlds together. So what happens in the applied math world is Everybody writes Python, but they don't invest the time in cre creating modular functions, thinking about types. Uh, most of them have never heard of functional programming. And in the software design world, I, see, I don't see that much interest to get into like numerical math. Um, so this, in this book, what we're trying to do is, the math is very rich and interesting, in the applied math, RL being a branch of applied math but we are also bringing in lots of elements of software design. So every time we develop a concept or an algorithm, we code it, but we code it in a way that it's modular, it can be reused in future chapters. We talk a lot about why this interface was designed in this way. It's because it has to follow the math that we did in the previous section. Ashwin, that's a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up. And you know, Chikan, having been a Jane Street alum, you know, Jane Street and Two Sigma are just known for having the most beautiful code. All of my friends who've worked there just are so inspired by the code. And there's so many quant funds out there with, with really dirty code. And you know, I, I think writing very clean, fantastic, beautiful code is extraordinarily essential. It's it's like trying to play a sport, yet not you know be in shape or have the proper training. It's, it's just it's an absurd endeavor. So now I'm I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, Tcon, would you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I found that paying attention to code quality and to the overall design of your system um, pays off in any kind of endeavor, even research code. And it does it on a much shorter time scale than people appreciate. Uh, I've certainly had projects where I've saved, you know, maybe a day's worth of upfront effort ends up paying off within the next two weeks by helping me avoid bugs I would otherwise have to debug or making it easy for me to iterate quickly. The entire book that we're writing is being designed with this in mind. And one of the lessons that we hope to impart is not just the foundations of reinforcement learning, but more generally how to build an intuition and a natural approach to taking mathematical ideas and expressing them as programming abstractions that work well from a sort of code design and maintainability point of view. Oh, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Uh, you, know, the, you know, this is exactly why I asked you guys to be on the, the show. I, um, I really appreciate the time you guys took. And uh, every viewer must check out this uh, book. Uh, Ashwin Rao, Tikhan Jelvis, you guys are absolutely brilliant. And I uh, thank you so, so, so much for coming on. And please stay safe in such crazy times. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Pleasure was all mine, you guys are fantastic.